For the past few months, the EDB Aerospace Division has been on a quest to develop an Earth orbit space plane, and in the process has done numerous tests with various designs of hypersonic aircraft. This is the DB-8. Its goal is to demonstrate control at altitude and set a new altitude record for the EDB. Its pilot is Rodwell Kerman. It is only the first in a series of designs that we will be featuring in this update. You can see the DB-8 taking off with some difficulty as its solid fuel boosters are powering it up to altitude before the lighting of the RL-10 liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen engine. The DB-8 of course follows in the footsteps of the DB-6. The DB-6, the first space plane to be able to take off from a runway and reach altitudes greater than 100 kilometers. As the DB-8 was close to SRB burnout, it lit its RL-10 engine. And then Rodwell got ready to dump the SRBs as they expended themselves. And there we saw one of the recurring issues with the past few months in EDB development, and that is a failure of separation of the SRBs uh, during supersonic flight. The SRBs tend to get sucked back into the aircraft during supersonic flight, and that will be a recurring theme in this update. The DB-8 has a very unique flight profile that is meant to keep it from straying too far away from Kennedy Space Center and that requires it to go to a, past a 90 degree pitch and essentially flip over in order to burn retrograde uh, so bringing it back to the west and then at a certain altitude it will uh, after it has gone too far west essentially it will once again uh, burn retrograde on the opposite side in order to head back east in order to eventually attempt a landing at Cape Canaveral and here you see the first of those flips this flip uh, occurred at 23 kilometers altitude uh, at that point uh, the aerodynamic uh, surfaces were still relatively responsive and so they were primarily responsible for making this maneuver and part of the goal of DB-8 is to see what kind of maneuvers are possible without the use of RCS fuel at various altitudes and so uh, here we see that Rodwell is turning the aircraft around with uh, relative ease so roll control was still possible at that altitude. Total burn time for the RL-10 was 6 minutes and 49 seconds though there was no expectation that Rodwell would use the entire burn time of the engine. Uh, total delta V was 5776. The boosters provide 828 meters per second of delta V burning for one minute. The total delta V of the craft is 6,604 meters per second, certainly not enough to make orbit. The mass of the plane, as we see Rodwell doing the second flip at 58 kilometers. Here he had a little bit more trouble controlling the craft. As you can see, the aerodynamic surfaces were not quite as responsive, and mainly it was the engine gimbling on the RL-10 that uh, kept him in line. That was at 58 kilometers, and then the engine out occurred 6 minutes and 51 seconds into flight and that left 1245 meters per second of delta V left. Apoapsis occurred at 124 kilometers and so Rodwell Kerman uh, did earn his astronaut wings. As I was mentioning before the mass of the vehicle was 19.42 tons Max thrust to weight ratio 2.91, assuming that the RL-10 was burned to its endpoint, uh, its uh, fuel out point, which it was not. Here we see the descent for Rodwell Kerman as he continued aiming for the KSC. However, at a certain point, he lost control of the craft. A small deviation caused the craft to start flipping. In desperation, Rodwell decided to light the RL-10 using some of the remaining fuel and at this point his vertical speed was 1000 meters per second towards the surface so negative 1110 in fact meters per second it's going straight down 2000 miles an hour in excess of 2000 miles an hour uh, unfortunately lighting the engine simply 
produced extreme aerodynamic stress. This loss of control occurred 58 kilometers. Loss of the wing, the left wing, occurred at 35 kilometers. That was uh, T minus 10 minutes or so. Lost the wing was T minus 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Rodwell stayed with the craft as it descended and waited until it had reached a safe vertical velocity and at that point at 6.6 .6 kilometers decided to bail out. That was at T plus 13 minutes. Rodwell was uh, fairly close to the KSC at this point and upon reaching the surface safely began to make his way back to the KSC uh, meeting meeting rescue crews halfway. Despite the loss of the aircraft in the DB-8 mission the EDB Aerospace Division decided to plunge ahead with even riskier designs and missions and thus came the DB-9 piloted by Wilbur Skirman. The DB-9 was based off of the DB-8 However, it used special boosters at its wingtips, and these special boosters were supposed to be thrust limited to 40%, but that failed. Uh, they had their full 100% rated thrust on takeoff, and that led to this disaster with Wilbur's Kerman being unable to control the craft at all. Uh, he was managed, able to take off, but, but really, uh, crash or disintegration was inevitable. This is the DB-9A with adjusted boosters, piloted by Kermel Kerman. Kermel Kerman had the goal of making a speed record and testing re-entry heating on the craft. You can see the craft is barely, barely stable even at this point. And Kermel Kerman is having trouble getting it off the ground at 300 miles an hour. But it does get off the ground and Colonel Kerman is underway. Total delta V for this vehicle is 6,475 meters per second, certainly short of orbit. In fact, uh, for the most part, it is similar in profile to the DB-8. The goal here is to go as quickly as possible and test re-entry heating and attitude control. And here we have booster separation and in this case booster separation caused a loss of control surfaces which of course would hinder attitude control. However despite this Colonel Kerman decided to proceed with the RL-10 test and aim to be the fastest Kerbal in an aircraft ever. This was of course inadvisable because he would not have pitch control in order to uh, protect himself from re-entry heating but he proceeded anyway. You'll note that there's no attempt to keep this close to the KSC and the reason for that is from the get-go Colonel Kerman would have to bail out of the aircraft in the in the mid-Atlantic and so rescue crews were ready to rescue him as he bailed out of the craft if able to. Here you see the craft going faster than the X-15 making its way well into the Atlantic, away from the Florida coast. Mass of this plane is 12.55 tons, and there's engine out of the RL-10. Engine out occurred at T plus 5 minutes and 35 seconds. Velocity was 4,533 meters per second at 99 kilometers altitude. That's 10,000 miles an hour. Here you see the intended re-entry attitude, but Colonel Kerman could not maintain that even with RCS on. There is some debate as to whether the loss of the control surfaces or the simple bad design of the aircraft were responsible for inability to control it, but uh, when Colonel Kerman eventually hit the, the hottest part of the atmosphere, he could not maintain attitude control and was essentially level, nose first through the hottest part of the atmosphere. At roughly an altitude of 45 kilometers, vehicle and pilot were lost at T plus 8 minutes and 16 seconds at a speed greater than 4.3 kilometers per second. This is the DB-10, stylized DB-X, 
and it is piloted by Pomeroy Kerman. The goal of this is to test controllability at hypersonic speeds. Once again, the rocket engine is an RL-10, burning liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. However, we see that this aircraft uses jets to reach high altitude instead of the solid rocket boosters. The jets are barely able to lift this craft off the ground and produce any lift at all, in fact, as it takes the entire runway. It is not because the craft requires a great deal of speed. It is, in fact, going at about 80 to 90 meters per second, roughly 160 to 180 miles an hour there. And so Pomeroy Kerman brought the aircraft, the DB-10, around towards the Florida coast and then made his way inland as he was simply gaining altitude in order to test hypersonic maneuverability. He would slowly, slowly gain altitude using the jet engines. Stability was okay throughout jet flight. As you can see, level flight quite stable. Mass of the vehicle was 22.56 tons on takeoff. Max thrust weight ratio through the rocket stage was 1.36, so the rocket was not providing too big of a thrust, and that's why it was deemed safe to bring it inland. Of course, it could be shut down at any time. The burn time for the RL-10 for this aircraft was 8 minutes and 26 seconds. The mission profile had primary Kerman crossing Florida and then beginning hypersonic testing in the Gulf of Mexico. So he would exceed Mach 5 and then turn around and return back to Cape Canaveral. Aircraft stability and maneuverability remained solid throughout the Jet Plus rocket stage and then 7 minutes and 34 seconds into the flight Palmer Kerman turned off the jet engines and we should see that there that was at an altitude of 17 kilometers traveling at 390 meters per second uh, roughly Mach 1.3 Palmer Kerman uh, began doing basic maneuvers but immediately discovered a lack of control Loss of control began at T plus 9 minutes and 5 seconds as he approached the west coast of Florida at an altitude of roughly 28.6 kilometers traveling at 649 meters per second Mach 2.2 You can see there Palmer Kerman struggling with the craft and eventually deciding to turn it retrograde in order to do a burn back much as the DB-8 did and here you can see he is essentially flying backwards here using the thrust of the RL-10 to help him return back to Cape Canaveral he was forced into the burn back position at T plus 9 minutes and 30 seconds and it took for two minutes before his speed was actually reversed so he began to gain speed towards Cape Canaveral at T plus 11 minutes and 30 seconds at an altitude of 15.4 kilometers. Stability was still very very tenuous and you can see here Pomeroy very much struggling with the craft in every direction. Ultimately he decided to turn on the jets the jets were reactivated at T plus 12 minutes and 5 seconds at an altitude of 13.6 kilometers. At that point, stability was returned to the craft. It is still uncertain why the craft was so unstable in rocket mode, but so stable when burning the jets. There have been suggestions to mount two RL-10s to the back of craft instead of one, thereby improving maneuverability and controllability, but uh, there does not seem to be much inclination towards that at this point. For the time being, it seems as if the DB-10 will be the last of the EDB Aerospace RL-10 designs. Here you see Prabhupada Kerman bringing the craft with some difficulty towards the runway. It seemed to have some yaw control issues.
having trouble lining up the craft to the runway there. But here it comes in. A successful touchdown at roughly 210 miles an hour. Extremely high speeds for a touchdown and Pomeroy Kerman would use the bulk of the runway in order to slow down. Again, having some difficulty with handling but, but nothing he couldn't deal with. And there we have it, Pomeroy Kerman uh, bringing the DB-10 to a stop on the runway at Cape Canaveral. In terms of pilot and aircraft survivability, uh, certainly a successful flight test, though not providing the data that the uh, EDB Aerospace Division was looking for. Following the DB-10, the EDB Aerospace Division decided no longer to rely on the RL-10 engine as its go-to rocket engine, and thus designed the HSX-1 around the RS-25D engine, the Space Shuttle main engine. So the HSX-1 has a single Space Shuttle main engine in its tail. It is a formidable and extremely large design, mainly a tank filled with hydrogen and oxygen. Its mass is 168.4 tons. Uh, that means that it is uh, more than seven times the mass of the DB-10. The pilot for the HSX-1 for its first flight was Dunler Kerman. This is the first orbital space plane design for the EDB Aerospace Division. It has just enough delta V to get into space, into orbit, but not enough to go much past that. In fact, uh, Dunler Kerman, should he reach orbit, would have to stay there. He has 20 days worth of supplies and eventually a rescue ship would rendezvous with him. This craft is not not capable of re-entering at this point. You can see also it's barely able to take off. Its landing gear stressed to the max as its takeoff velocity is 140 meters per second. That's 280 miles an hour in excess of 280 miles an hour and it still relies partly on the gimbling of the RS-25 engine in order to manage to lift its nose up. And here you see the nose up and a successful lift off. But then shortly into flight, just as the landing gear was being lifted here, uh, aerodynamic failure of the wings, uh, complete disintegration of the wings. Here is the belly cam on the main body of the aircraft. However, while the main body of the craft smash into the ground like this. The forward portion of the vehicle managed to continue gliding which allowed Dunler Kerman to bail out and we should see that here. And there we have Dunler Kerman bailing out just before the craft smashed into the ground and he managed to make his way back to the European Space Agency headquarters here at French Guiana where the plane was first tested. And that meant that Dunlop Kerman was available for a second flight of the HSX-1. And indeed, he did take that opportunity up. And so here he is with the second flight, again in French Guiana, at the European Space Agency's launch center. And that is because, of course, it is closer to the equator and therefore easier to get into orbit from this center as opposed to Cape Canaveral. The wings were reinforced for this second flight and so there was little concern about the wings experiencing failure due to aerodynamic stress again. Incidentally, while the takeoff speed for this craft is approximately 280 miles an hour, that is not its landing speed. Its landing speed is much, much lower thanks to the fact that it burns off almost all of its mass before landing. Its landing velocity is around 60 to 70 meters per second or about 120 to 140 miles an hour. Here we see Dunler Kerman successfully getting the craft to its, its proper attitude during the phase of flight where it carries its drop tanks. Its drop tanks are about 19 tons apiece and they supply fuel for the RS-25 for a minute and 8 seconds. And so here, 
Dunlop Kerbin has the craft at about a 60 degree pitch. While there was some wiggling, the craft was mostly stable throughout the drop tank phase, the first stage if you will, with the drop tanks. And then came time for drop tank separation and, and unfortunately the drop tanks got sucked in to the craft. That resulted in disintegration of all of the extremely lightweight craft except for the reinforced cockpit. The cockpit is really the only structurally sound part of the craft. The rest of it is very, very light. And here you see Dunler Kerman once again surviving the disintegration of his aircraft, the HSX-1, and eventually making his way down to the Atlantic Ocean off the coast. After two failed tests in French Guiana, the EDB Aerospace Division decided to move testing back over to Cape Canaveral and uh, this would require the use of RCS fuel in order to actually get the craft into a stable orbit, but they calculated that that was possible. The craft takes uh, monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide as its RCS fuel and so it would have to burn those in order to get into a stable orbit from Cape, uh, launching from Cape Canaveral. And so here it is, the third flight of the HSX-1. The recommendation this time was to drop the tanks at a lower pitch. So Dunlop Kerman would attempt to uh, reduce his pitch before dropping the tanks used to fuel the RS-25 during its first minute of burn and it was a successful takeoff and a little bit of pitch control issue but Dunlop Kerman managed to get the craft stable. Obviously there's good reason to be concerned that their only solution for the drop tank issue was to reduce pitch before releasing them. However it was impossible to put separatrons on the drop tanks because they would almost certainly damage the body of the craft and so options were rather limited in terms of solutions for this problem. And here we see drop tank separation and they disintegrate however they do not damage the HSX-1. It continues to fly on with its it's a sub substantial load of fuel. It still is 130 tons mostly fuel. And in fact there is fuel stored in the wings. There is fuel stored at every location that they could manage to fit fuel in this plane. Total delta V with the RS-25 is 8,500 meters per second, which means the plane relies heavily on lift from the wings in order to make up the balance in terms of getting to orbit. It does require less delta V than a rocket would. However, we see here that uh, for reasons unknown, Donald Kerman started to lose control as the craft exceeded Mach 4. Uh, he struggled to regain control but uh, experienced consistent difficulty with that. Ultimately had no choice. Uh, he tried to aim for a retro burn back to Cape Canaveral. Uh, in fact uh, the plane was somewhat automatically pointing in that direction. These roll issues started at T plus 2 minutes and 35 seconds with RCS on. He had activated the RCS system in order to maintain stability. Altitude uh, at the start of the issues was about 36 kilometers. Uh, velocity was exceeding Mach 3, uh, just short of Mach 4. So Dunler attempted a burn back to the Cape and in fact uh, completed that uh, he his prograde vector was now pointing at Florida however there was uh, still no sign of stability as he struggled to control the craft. Dunler seemed to have reasonable control though until he started to attempt to throttle down the RS-25. Remember the RS-25 is capable of throttling down to 68 percent of rated thrust and uh, here we see he it, at, almost as soon as he reduced thrust, he started spinning completely out of control. And this was very critical because this is still a very hot portion of the atmosphere. And as we continue to see him out of control, we will also see him begin to overheat. 
the designers of the HSX one are very distressed by by this because there was no expectation that it would have stability issues at altitude or speed. It was considered sound on those scores. But uh, but the evidence is right here. As we see, once again, the cockpit being the only part that managed to survive. And the rest of the craft is very, very lightweight, very, very thin. Cryogenic tanks for most of the body, the wings extremely thin, uh, carrying lots of fuel inside of them. But at least the cockpit, cockpit which was um, uh, comes in at a weight of about 3.5 tons, managed to survive. And Dunlop Kerman managed to bail out again. The disintegration of the craft occurred at T plus 5 minutes at about 35 kilometers in altitude. The craft was still going in excess of Mach 3. Dunlop Kerman managed to survive the third time his HSX-1 disintegrated. So with that, uh, this ends the update of the EDB's attempt to reach orbit in a space plane. Uh, the EDB still has no access to uh, Sabre or Rapier engines, which could use both um, jet mode and rocket mode, a closed cycle mode, as well as an air breathing mode. It is still attempting to reach orbit without such technology and uh, will continue to do so. Will the HSX-1 make a subsequent flight in an attempt to reach orbit? We do not know. We do not know whether there will be a new design to replace it. But for now, that is the end of our update of the EDB Aerospace Division's activities for the past few months. We thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and we will see you next time.